and welcome to episode 26 of Little Big Knits. This is a podcast about knitting and my name is Selma, also known as Selma Knits on Ravelry and Instagram. And I am coming to you again from Ottawa, not from Uruguay this time, um, where I live here in Ottawa with my family, my husband, my two kids and our cat Yoda who is sleeping on the couch right in front of me. So welcome and uh, hope this last month has found you well. So we also have a Ravelry group called Little Big Knits and please feel free to come and say hello in, in the group and join in and join in in any of the conversation that's happening there. Thank you to those of you who come in and introduce yourselves. I really appreciate it. It's a great way to get to know who's watching and who's uh, interacting in the group. And thank you for joining me today. Uh, if you're new, welcome to Little Big Knits and I hope you'll enjoy it. And if you're returning, thank you so much for coming back and spending time with me again. Um, I really love checking in every once in a while and I love the interactions that are happening here on YouTube or in the Ravelry group or even on Instagram. So thank you so much. It's really nice to, to be part of this community. And as with regards to my last episode, thank you so much for all the uh, positive comments about um, about the episode, but also about the footage. I'm glad you enjoyed the scenes of Uruguay. I really have actually watched the footage over and over again of Uruguay. It's a great way for me even to just remember our trip. And uh, yeah, and it was just really nice to get all the feedback from you guys. So thank you so much. And uh, it's always a pleasure to, of course, have likes and new subscribers. So welcome and thank you. Um, so what have we got on today? Um, today, I think we're going to be talking about knitting. That's usually what we do. And um, I've had a few questions. So after I've talked to you a little bit about what I've finished and what I'm working on and a little bit about acquisitions, uh, things that have come into my life lately, I thought that I would answer a few questions that I've received recently. And then I thought I'd finish the episode uh, with a little bit of blather and telling you about the books that I've read uh, recently that have been um, actually all just really wonderful. So I'll tell you a little bit about that and then I will leave you with footage of um, our last day in Uruguay. Actually we went to uh, a Manos de Uruguay store and so I took a little bit of footage of that so I'll just leave that for you at the end. At the beginning of this episode you saw some of the more um, stark views. When we first came back from uh, Uruguay, it was a little bit of a shock, I have to say, to come home to snow and cold. Although it wasn't terribly cold, but just snow and gray and uh, it was a little weird, but I got some footage and now we've got flowers coming out. So the crocuses and the other little first flowers, the snowdrops and other ones that are coming out are, are starting to come out from the dead leaves and which is uh, very, very spring-like on this uh, Easter season. So it's been really, really nice. So anyway, let me get on with, uh, with the episode and hope you've got yourself a cup of something or a glass of something or a bowl of something to enjoy. I am drinking a tea out of this wonderful Nicholas Moss mug that my friend Kate of the Hawthorne Cottage Craft brought for me when she came to visit, geez, two Rhinebecks ago, I think. And in it, I am drinking a tea that I bought in Finland last summer that is a green tea with sea buckthorn. It's called Turnite, and uh, I've really enjoyed this a lot, actually. I bought it on a whim at the airport when I was leaving, and uh, but I actually really enjoyed it, so I've been drinking that little bit here and there when I'm in the mood for green tea. So, cheers. I feel like I'm already kind of like, where am I going next? Oops, I already told you where I'm going next. But before I go anywhere, I wanted to apologize to the moths of the world because some of the comments that I received, uh, I think there are about three people who commented on the last episode that there was no way that moths had eaten into 
the um, Good Vibes shawl. Right, if you watched last time, you'll recall that I had the yellow and cream colored shawl with me in Uruguay. And when we were at the ranch and I left the shawl in the dining room there for, a, 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 I think one night, but kind of like two days, um, it ended up with rather substantial holes in it. And I blamed the moths. And uh, people corrected me in saying that moths don't eat wool just like that. Um, usually what happens is that they lay their egg, eggs in, in wool or, and it's the larva that will eat the wool and that's not going to happen so fast and it's actually only a few varieties that might do that. So um, there were suggestions that perhaps it was mice, perhaps it was ants. Um, so it looks like it probably wasn't moths but whatever it was certainly ravaged uh, the shawl fairly quickly. A little bit substantial but not huge substantial, uh, enough that it required some uh, pretty handy uh, fixing work from my mother-in-law. And I told her about all the lovely comments about her work as well. Thank you. And, um, and now the shawl is great. Uh, but uh, yeah, it probably wasn't the moth. So I felt like I owed the moths of the world an apology. There was so much wildlife at the ranch. There were frogs every night, all night long, all over the walls and moths of all kinds of sizes and um, patterns and um, there could have been mice. I didn't see them. There probably were ants. So who knows, who knows what it was that, uh, that ate up the shawl. So anyway, I just wanted to do that before I moved forward. Um, and thank you. Thank you for correcting me on that. So starting with FOs, as usual, I have two for you today, one of which I'm wearing and it's my finished Yume sweater. I showed it to you as a, I think I showed you the finished body in my last episode. I had only brought two skeins of yarn with me to Uruguay, so I finished the body and I had a little bit left that I could have started one of the sleeves, but I decided just to wait until I got home. So when I got home, I, I definitely worked on the sleeves and finished them. I made I made long sleeves and I'll just stand up and give you a little bit of a body view of it. Here it is. With a nice, very simple, but lovely little lace detail here. The neck ended up being a little bit more open than I thought it would be when I had first done it, but, um, but it's quite lovely. There's a bit of short row shaping on the back, although I find that the back is still quite low but it's all right. So this is called the Yume, and it's a design by Isabel Kramer. Um, and I realized that I've actually made, I think, three Isabel Kramer sweaters at this point. I made the Arwen, I made the On the Beach, which was one of her earlier designs. I think it's actually a free pattern, um, a contiguous construction that I made. I've never worn it on the podcast, so I will do that one day. And I really like her pattern writing, very clear, very effective. Her designs are usually simple designs that are just neat and effective. And um, I own a couple more of her patterns, so we'll see uh, if and when <laughs> those get made. So I really enjoyed this. It was a delightful knit, and certainly another part of it that was delightful was the yarn. This was yarn by Ancient Arts called uh, Revival. And I told you guys about it last time. It was a combination, oh, let's see if I remember, it was a combination of wool and mohair and silk and acrylic, I believe. A very small portion of silk and acrylic, mostly wool and mohair. And I bought this yarn at a local yarn store called Wabi Sabi, which is a, a couple of kilometers down the road from me here. And I have to say, I, I really wanted a green sweater. If you'll recall, if you watched last time and the time before when I had actually bought the yarn, I really wanted a green sweater in my life. Um, and I had seen this yarn uh, before I went to Vogue Knitting Live and I thought, well, if I don't find any yarn at Vogue Knitting Live that I really want to have that's green, then I'm going to go back and buy the Revival. And I didn't see uh, any, uh, any green yarns. Most of them were very variegated and I wanted something that was more tonal. And just to make a nice simple green sweater. So I went back to Wabi Sabi and I bought this. But I have to say, it's such a beautiful, rich green. I think the color is coming out there. Just stunning. And they had so many beautiful colors. 
it was really hard to choose. Um, really, really rich colors. There was a gorgeous tomatoey red that was just stunning. There was a beautiful blue. There was so many beautiful colors. Actually, they had a beige that was such a rich beige. Um, I did end up buying one skein to probably put in a shawl, but uh, really, really rich colors. It's got mohair, so there's a little bit, I don't know if you can see it, there's a little bit of a fluffiness to it tiny bit scratchy um, which I'm I'm not very sensitive to so I'm okay with it but I could see how somebody would find this a little bit scratchy but I'm I've worn it already a couple of times since I finished it um, actually more than that I think three or four times and I find it extremely comfortable um, and uh, it's been fine although I don't know that I'll wear this it'll be interesting to see today is supposed to be quite a lovely warm day um, we're actually gonna have like 15 degrees today we had such a cold winter this year it was it was such it was actually a brutal winter and I was really glad to get away for three weeks um, it was a hard winter so it's just such a joy to have some sunshine have a little bit of warmth and be able to walk around a little bit more carefree than constantly kind of bundled up um, i realized when we were in uruguay for three weeks that winter is a bit tiring um, because you're just always having to bundle up there's you're always kind of closed in um, keeping warm you know there's the snow and the shoveling and the cleaning and the warming up of and it's just there's a lot of work to it so it's kind of nice to have the more carefree spring coming along i'm really enjoying it so we'll see if this is uh how this fares when the weather's a little warmer but um yeah and i just the colors are so rich in this line that i would love to buy some more of it i think at some point um, they still continue to have it at wabi sabi so um and that tomato red is still there i've been thinking about it but anyway i'm trying to be a little bit uh, there was a lot of yarn that came into my life this winter uh well rhinebeck and then vogue knitting live and then being in uruguay so i feel like i should probably um slow down at least until my birthday which is in june so we'll see i i know that i want to get some something for my birthday for sure but uh for now I think I'll just enjoy this green yarn that I really, really loved working with. It was beautiful. So highly recommend the pattern. It's simple, very, very uh, simple lace pattern here. So nothing terribly advanced. And Isabel Kramer's uh, patterns are really very well written and easy to follow. So if you are in mind thinking about, uh, if you have in mind uh, wanting to knit um, a yoked sweater. I would recommend any of Isabelle's patterns really. So uh, so there you go. This is finished object number one. Finished object number two has decided to go behind me. I guess I put it there. I was also, I showed this to you when I was in Uruguay um, and I, I won't put it on and I actually haven't taken any pictures of it yet. Um, and when I do, I'll put them up on Instagram and, and um, maybe show you here, but I was re-knitting the torso of the garter yoke cardigan by Melissa Labar, and in my last episode, it was still wet. Um, and so here it is, I have added on some buttons. I got some lovely buttons from a store nearby called Daryl Thomas, which is a um, sort of a designer fabric store, but they have a very good button selection. So I went and I got these buttons, which I thought really, really, jazzed up this cardigan and it's just got a straight slightly more boxy construction and I love it I've already worn it as well to work a couple of times and it's just really 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 nice let's see if I could put it on this cardigan for a really Christmassy look here we are at Easter and I'm I'm looking Christmassy so just so you can have a look, have a see of what it looks like, and I'll stand up. So it's just a, it's just a straight boxy, about the same length as this sweater actually, and um, just really, really lovely. I'm so happy that I did that, and it was the perfect project to take to Uruguay because I didn't have other things distracting me. I have a feeling that had I done that here, I would have procrastinated 
whereas there I had finished the body of this and so I just decided to work on it and it just when I wet it it just the, the stitches all straightened out beautifully and I've just really enjoyed it it's a lovely lovely color the yarn is from Foster's Sheep Foster's Sheep Farm uh, which is in upstate New York so there you go that is finished object kind of like a refinished object um, number two for the episode today so that is what I have finished lately and actually um, this sweater ended up being in this bag after a while because it outgrew the bag that I had it in I think I had it in the Mari Mekko bag that I had made and it ended up being in this uh, beautiful bag by Sandy by the lakeside or by the lakeside um, and uh, that I had bought um, earlier in the winter and it was just such a wonderful wonderful bag to put it in and actually this bag now has um, another project which actually segues very nicely into my works in progress and what is in here is a sweater that is almost finished which is another green sweater I called this episode Knit Your Greens and that is because there's a lot of green in my life. I've been wanting to make green and it seems like mint is actually um, a bit of a color of this season and uh, I bought this beautiful yarn. Actually, I don't know that I have a label in here, I'm realizing, but this is, um, this is uh, the same company that I used for my previous nuke. So if you've been around for a while and if you're one of these people who remembers things, you'll remember that I made a nuke, which is a uh, simple sweater pattern by Yonna Hietala, which was in the first Lina magazine. It's a very simple raglan, um, round neck, short sleeve construction, kind of a layering piece, and I made it in gray out of this yarn, except that one was Aran and this one's DK, and it's the Whistle Bear uh, Yivering, Yivering Bell in their DK. It's an 80% mohair and 20% Wensleydale yarn. And this one is in this very sort of, I think they called it apple green. I'm not sure, but it's in this very, very pale sort of minty green. And I had bought it at EYF two years ago along with the other Whistleberry yarn. So I'm glad to be using it. I didn't go to EYF this year. I had planned to go to EYF. Um, but then when we chose the dates for going to Uruguay and that was what made most sense with the children's uh, March break and stuff like that, I realized there was no way I was going to be able to come home and essentially 36 hours later or, or 48 hours later jump on another plane um, and rush to EYF and so I cancelled that. Um, but I thought I should knit up the yarn that I got there two years ago. I really enjoyed seeing all the footage. Um, I only had a little bit of FOMO, which is fear of missing out. Um, mostly I just really enjoyed seeing people's footage. And honestly, when we came back from Uruguay, I was so exhausted. Um, we were so relaxed and, you know, everything was so wonderful and relaxed in, in Uruguay. But the trip is a long trip and uh, we almost missed a flight Again, we were running through the airport in Sao Paulo to make our flight because our flight from Montevideo was delayed. We did make it, but uh, that is always a little stressful and you don't sleep well and it's an overnight flight and it's long. So I have to say that whole first week I was really very tired. Um, I think if I had gone to EYF, I, I just, I probably would have come back quite sick because I just would have been really, it would have been so exhausting. So I'm glad I didn't go. I do hope again. I hope that I'll be able to go again at some point. But I'm wanting to use up the yarns from there. So I decided to make a second nuke, which I was or had been the plan and, and it didn't end up changing uh, out of this yarn, something that would be a nice light spring uh, layering piece. Um, but I wanted to add a little bit of interest this time. So I decided to add a lace motif. So right now it's looking a little messy because this needs to get blocked a bit and then the lace motif will uh, 
will kind of stretch out a little bit and be a little bit clearer. So it's going to be like that with a split hem, which again will also relax once I've, I've wet this and most likely just short sleeves. Um, so it's the kind of thing that I would wear, uh, you know, in warmer weather with a blouse underneath. I'm not 100% convinced about the short sleeves. I'll decide that later today. I've certainly got enough yarn, but um, it's just been a wonderful, simple, fast knit. It was knit on four and a half millimeter needles. And I took, uh, I took the lace motif from a, uh, what do you call that? A stitch dictionary. I think it was the Vogue stitch dictionary, volume one. Um, and these lace motifs were supposed to be much closer together. There's only supposed to be like one row between each motif. And I added about 15 rows. And uh, so there we go. It is almost done. I just have the sleeves and if I do make them short sleeves, I'll probably just knit three, four rows and then do the ribbing and that's it. I used a smaller needle on the ribbing and um, I haven't even tried it on. I finished the ribbing last night before going to bed and I haven't tried this on, but I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be just fine. <laughs> if not, I can redo redo the ribbing here. And I know from this yarn, and having worked with um, yarn that has a, a higher mohair content, that mohair can be a little bit unruly when there's a lot of it, but then once you block it, it just completely obeys and sits properly. So I'm sure that's what's going to happen here, because right now it's looking rather unruly, but I am hoping to have this finished today and block it and hopefully wear it at some point this week with I have a very sort of light gauzy white shirt blouse top um, that I'm hoping will look nice with this uh, or even sort of like a long sleeve t-shirt um, it's quite transparent so I'm not sure that wearing a shirt that's kind of a button-up I feel like it needs to have something light underneath it so we'll see how I end up wearing it but hopefully I'll show you next time I absolutely love this yarn and this is such a great pattern the nuke it's just a really good solid um, shape of a raglan top down raglan top so it's a it's kind of a nice canvas for for other things um, I wanted a simple lace pattern and I might even almost do it again with a different kind of motif on it but uh, yeah it's just it's got um, a solid stitch count for the separations and uh, the gray one that I made, I was slightly disappointed in the in the way the yarn kind of, it pooled a little bit in strange ways and looks a bit tiger-like. So I have to say, I don't really wear it at work, but I often wear it on the weekends uh, with jeans and a long-sleeved uh, t-shirt underneath. And it's really, like I, I love wearing it. It's very warm, very cozy and comfy and um, I've really enjoyed it. I've worn it a lot, but I just don't necessarily, I didn't like what happened in the yarn so much, whereas, and I didn't expect it to happen, so if I had realized it would happen, I might have double, you know, um, alternated skeins, whereas here, it just seems to be a fairly solid color, so we're okay. So there we go. So that has been a real joy. It's been a very quick knit for sure. Um, and um, I have to start thinking about what I want to make next. And I'm, I'm a little bit at a loss. I am, I've got some ideas, um, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure what's going to happen next. We'll have to see. Another whip, which I haven't worked on since I came home, but I didn't show it to you last episode because I didn't take it with me to Uruguay, was the Myrtle. And I think the previous episode when I showed it to you, I hadn't quite finished the body. I have finished the body, so one thing that I need to do next is to uh, start the sleeves. And I was actually thinking of perhaps doing the, um, the collar, the ribbing around the neck, and then blocking it to decide about the sleeves because I actually pondered perhaps doing short sleeves rather than long sleeves as are meant 
on this sweater. I thought perhaps, but this is what it looks like so far. Um, I've had one of the reasons that I've been a little bit slow to keep moving on this. Uh, it's not that I've lost my mojo with the sweater, but I'm a, I'm not 100% sure I love this. So I think I will finish it, perhaps, but I have to decide whether I want to make it long-sleeved or short-sleeved. That's going to be the next decision. But as you can see, it's a bit of a shorter construction than the, than the gray one, um, and it'll be boxy. So I just have to make a decision about that because I thought it could be kind of cute as a short sleeve sweater and a bit of a layering piece rather than a long sleeve sweater. So that's something that I will decide. If you have an opinion, please feel free to share. <laughs> so there you go. So nothing has happened on that, but you know what, perhaps that's something that I'll do, I'll start doing this week. I think maybe what I'll do is finish up the collar and, and then wet block it and try it on and then I'll get a better sense of whether this is something I want to have long sleeves for or whether I would rather just have short sleeves. The next thing uh, I have been working on and I had in Uruguay was the match and move. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you that Myrtle has been living in this ink bag and it's actually kind of starting to almost outgrow the ink bag because I've got more yarn in there. Um, but it's been very happily living in this beautiful bag that I really enjoy so much. And I love the fact that you can see what's in it and I've got some nice little pins. That's an EYF pin and um, sunglasses that say, look on the bright side. And this yellow pin which says, easy peasy lemon squeezy. Hmm. My next project, which I had in Uruguay and I showed you, is still not finished. I really hoped it would be, and I'm sorry it's not. Um, it's in my Jenna Rose bag, which I absolutely adore. I love this bag, it's got such a great feeling to it. Um, and it's got some pins which I've showed you guys in the past as well. This one says, I feel like knit, and that one says fearless. And that is my match and move. And one of the reasons that my match and move is not finished, because I did do quite a bit of progress on it after the last episode. And then I decided when I came home uh, from Uruguay that I wanted to finish this. And I thought, well, this will be my work knit. Um, in the past, I had time to knit at lunchtime. But this winter has just been so busy at work. Um, I'm finding myself working through my lunch hour. Uh, which I don't like, um, and uh, being very busy and quite stressed at work. So I, since I came back from Uruguay, I've been able to knit maybe once a week, um, usually about once a week, whereas before it was more like three times a week. So this has not gotten the amount of love that I had hoped. Another decision I made about this, I had told you guys that I was probably going to do another band uh, or a band of a different color because I didn't think that I was going to have enough of the fingering weight yarn. What I've decided to do is the last band that should have been solid, I have decided to stripe the two yarns together and so that band will be a striped band. So we'll see how that ends up working out. I have slightly mixed feelings about it, um, but so I think the last time I podcasted, I was on, I believe I was just finishing this band here. So I have done quite a bit. I've done another full mohair band, and now I'm on this one here. And then once this band is finished, and when it's blocked out, you'll see the stripes quite clearly. Uh, and when this is finished, there is the last band, which will be a mohair band, and then the project will be finished. So I'm really not very far. Uh, so I am hoping to focus on this actually. I think when I finish the nuke today or tomorrow, I think I'll be, I think I'm going to just work on this one and finish this up in the next week um, so that I can wear it because I think that this will be still nice to wear in the spring. It'll be a beautiful, you know, beautiful striped shawl, light, and I just love this color. This is just, this is, 
This is one of my favorite types of colors, is this kind of stormy gray color that's got a bit of blue in it. I just love, love, love that kind of color. So, so next time, how about this? I'm going to promise next time that this shawl is finished and blocked. This, as I said, was the Match and Move, which is by Martina Baim, and I am knitting it in the Shibui Silk Cloud, which is really probably the softest mohair out there. If you're looking for a mohair that you think will be uh, as unscratchy as possible, this is probably it. The reason being that it's got 40% silk content in it so it's it's very very soft and the mohair is just uh, I think they've picked the down uh, or the softest of the mohair possible so this is a pricey mohair but if you're really looking for something soft this is definitely it it's really quite stunning I have to say um, and and beautiful to knit with and even just touching the finished fabric it almost feels more like angora than it does like mohair very soft and I think this is the graphite colorway but it's the gray that's got a little bit of a blue to it and the other yarn is a mystery yarn that I had dyed which I've mentioned to you guys before I mean I love mohair and I will knit with any mohair <laughs> Uh, and gee, there's often mohair, like there's mohair content in here. Mohair and linen are two fibers that I'm just instantly drawn to. Um, and so if a yarn, if I see a yarn and I'm drawn to it, um, the chances that it has mohair or linen in it are usually quite high. <laughs> just the way it is, somehow. Love those two fibers. The last thing that I've been working on, I have not given a BB's blanket any love, but I have been giving um, my blanket quite a bit of love. So you'll recall my big square crocheted blanket. I showed it to you last time. And last time I showed it to you, let me get myself oriented here, I believe I was on this sort of dusty pink um, square. So I have cro crocheted several blankets in and actually even added this green, which is this sweater right here. Um, so I think I'm on row eight now and there need to be 11 rows, so I'm getting close. I have not been crocheting on this or working on this quite as diligently as um, as I hoped since I got back, I sort of lost a little bit of my mojo, but I, I have seen, still been putting in squares. Before we left for Uruguay, I was diligent in doing it every day, so I have advanced quite nicely, but since I got back, oh, I haven't put in a huge number of squares. Um, but I have kept on doing it, and a few times a week, so we are still moving forward. You may recall me mentioning uh, Marta of Martushka Yarns. She is um, actually hosting, she's got a podcast, and she is hosting a crocheted blanket along. Actually, I'm not 100% sure what you're calling it, Marta. But um, uh, so that I'm hoping will motivate me to keep on working with this. And she's got amazing prizes that she is drawing every month. So if you're working on a blanket, I suggest you start watching Marta and joining in all in, in all the fun there's quite some quite fun conversation going in on there so yeah so I've been working on this little by little adding squares um, I don't even know what most of the yarn is to be honest anymore there are minis that I've collected here and there but I've been really enjoying on working on it um, my friend Holly dropped by the other day and brought an awful lot of fantastic minis and so I worked on while we were chatting, I worked on a couple, and this mini is so stunning. This is actually Woolen Vine Yarns in her Prickly Pear colorway, which I've always admired, and now I'm admiring it even more. It's just beautiful, and this actually has gold stellina. I'm not sure if you can see it, but I just love the sort of the pale blue with the olivey, mustardy greens in there. Just an interesting combination. Um, and this one is The Loving Path, which is an Ontario dyer, I believe. So she just brought a whole bunch of minis, and I just can't wait 
They are just all beautiful colors. I've been thinking about the next blanket and I've been thinking about the Northeasterly by Melissa of Skeenanigans. I can't remember her last name. I feel like there's a Stuart or a Lewis in there. <laughs> um, so she's got a beautiful chevron knitted blanket that is great for minis and I've been thinking about making one. So far I've always crocheted uh, blankets but I've been kind of thinking that perhaps a knit one would be next. Um, so I might save some of those minis for that. But certainly the woolen vine is going to be make it in, making it into this blanket, which I've just really been enjoying. The cream color I may have um, said before is uh, Sadness Garn Sisu, which is just a really uh, reasonably priced yarn, good solid sock yarn, an 80-20. And there's the label behind the yarn. And this is being housed by a bag that I made with some wonderful wool tartan fabric that I had gotten at a flea market. And um, there you go. Just love it. I got it at a flea market, which is actually coming up, and there was cotton as well. I just It's a great size, and the blanket is very happy in here right now. It's going to outgrow it. Um, in a row or two, but for now it is in here very happily. So that is really all that I have been working on. But I am reminded right now uh, when I talk about Martushka's uh, cal, uh, crochet along rather, that I haven't mentioned the cal that I'm hosting uh, in conjunction with my friend Kate of the Hawthorne Cottage Craft who gifted me this wonderful mug. So Kate and I are co-hosting a year-long knit-along called the Garment Galore Cal. Uh, the hashtag is down there. Please feel free to use it on Instagram. And so this is a year-long garment cal. So basically knitting any type of clothing, accessories are not um, included, and adult garments only. Um, we both have chatter threads and we both have general finished object threads. I also have a finished object thread for a men's sweater. So if you are knitting a men's sweater, you can also um, enter it there. So you can enter it in the general thread as well as in the men's sweater thread. And if you are knitting a yoked sweater, so this is a perfect example of a yoked sweater. You can also enter it in Kate's uh, group in her yoked sweater thread. So feel free to join us in a garment knitting, whether you are a new garment knitter or an experienced, you can um, enter as many garments in the year as you like. They can be sweaters, cardigans, vests, skirts, pants, any of anything that covers your torso essentially as a piece of clothing or garment. And uh, at the end of the year, we'll have prizes. May 1st, and Kate and I haven't talked about this, but May 1st we'll also be opening a thread for summer gar garments. So this would be any garment that is knit with plant fibers. Uh, so whether it's cotton or linen, nettle, bamboo. Uh, so we're going to have to come up with the details around that, whether it's um, uh, fully plant-based or it has to be a percentage. We'll get back to you on that one soon. But we'll be opening those threads um, in the next week or so in, in our group. So if you're into knitting with uh, summer string, so to speak, you can uh, enter it there. And if you finished something this year, as long as it was finished this year, but you didn't, um, you can also enter it there if you happen to make it out of summer fibers because people who are living in the Southern Hemisphere uh, may have been doing that. So feel free to enter it there uh, or at any time of the year. That thread will remain open until the end of December. I believe that's what we agreed. And this cal goes until December 31st. So join in, it's super fun. There's lots of projects already entered in, like well over 100. I think we might be in about 170 or 180. And um, men's sweaters, I think there were five <laughs> or something like that. Um, and that just shows you how underrepresented men's sweaters are. So let's see if we can get a few more in. Um, and um, there's lots of chatter too, and people uh, sharing what they're making and uh, chatting together and encouraging one another. 
and uh, it's been really, really great. I love going in every day and seeing what's happening and commenting myself. Just a little reminder not to comment in the FO threads. So if your comment has been deleted because it was a, it was a comment as opposed to um, a finished object uh, entry, uh, it's because I'm not allowing comments in there so that when we draw prizes, we're really drawing on finished projects. So um, I also commented accidentally one day and had to delete mine. So if you want to talk and chatter, keep it to the chatter threads. All right, so thanks for participating in that. So I just wanted to share a few acquisitions that came into my life over the last little while. Um, one of them was a beautiful and generous gift from uh, Darlene, who has a bag making business called Bags by Awesome Granny. You may know her. She has been around for a while. She makes wonderful bags and I've been wanting one for the longest time. So when she offered, to uh, give me a bag and a bag for a prize for the group, I jumped on it. But then it took me forever to decide which fabric because she has so many beautiful fabrics. It was really hard to decide. Uh, I just, I went in, I don't know, about four times and then I finally settled on something. And I settled on this beautiful sheep fabric, uh, black and white, uh, very sort of modern and the sheeps have hearts on them and it's a stunning bag so thank you so much Darlene um, I'm just so thrilled to finally have one of her bags and they've got wonderful matching fabric she's got a red zipper just really really um, wonderful choices of fabrics and it's beautifully made. It's also got a handle here, so it's easy to carry. This is her larger size, but she does make smaller ones as well, and I think she's got sets as well. Um, so Bags by Awesome Granny on Etsy, if you're interested and in looking for a bag, check her out. She's located in Texas, I believe, yes. And uh, yeah, I just, uh, this is just so beautiful. It was actually Alejandro who helped me choose because I just couldn't decide. So I said, which one of these should I get? I think I'd narrowed it down to three and he chose this one. So I'm very, very happy with it. And as I said, there is another one for the podcast and this will be going into the Garments Galore uh, Cal as, as a prize. So thank you again, Darlene. I'm just, Thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have such a beautiful prize. Um, something else that I ended up winning um, in a knit along that Lynn of the Wayward Skein was hosting for Bijou Basin Yarns or Annie Modisette Patterns. Um, and I ended up entering my fingerless gloves that I'd made in Bijou Basin yarn. And I ended up min um, winning a set of minis and a book. But the book I actually have at work, I haven't brought it home yet, uh, the Annie Modest set. So when I do, I'll show it to you guys. But uh, I ended up being, winning this set of really beautiful colored um, minis. And the fiber content is 75% yak down and 25% bamboo. And I actually think that this would really be beautiful in a color work of some sort. So I'm going to save these for that. It is stunning feeling yarn. Bijou Basin uh, are always at Rhinebeck and that's where I've seen their work. And um, they had sent me a scheme to try out of uh, their yarn that I talked to you guys about in a previous episode. Their work is really beautiful and their yarns are really interesting. And um, so I'm gonna be excited to have more yak yarn in my life because yak is a really interesting fiber. It's beautiful, it's soft. It's got kind of a, a slightly unusual texture to it, but very, very easy to work with. And when I say unusual, I just mean that it doesn't feel like a typical yarn. There is something a little different about it. It's warm. Um, the fingerless gloves that I've made for myself They've worn extremely well. I've worn them a lot. They've kept their shape, which is the design, but the yarn hasn't really pilled. It's just beautiful and warm. So I'm really, really thrilled to have, um, to have won this in her knit along. I don't usually enter other people's knit alongs actually, but I just happened to do it. And, um, oh, and the other little thing that came in that, excuse me while I, was this wool wash which I believe is also by uh, Bijou Basin. And it's their Allure 
wool wash. And this is scent free, so I've been thinking about perhaps adding something to it. And I look forward to using it in my, in my hand washes. And then the last thing I'm going to share with you is a, a, another bag by Patricia of Paradise Island who came to visit in Ottawa and I was so happy to be able to get together and uh, share a meal with Patricia and a couple of other friends of ours. We had a really good time and Patricia so kindly um, gifted me one of her sort of sock size bags which actually the nuke was in here until it grew too much and then it moved into the Sandy by the Lakeside. So these two makers are, are actually know one another and are friends and are both from Toronto. So I feel like there's a, a good representation of, of Canadian makers here. Uh, Patricia's bags are silk screened by her and made out of wonderful sturdy canvas. And uh, this is a metallic ink that she has used here. And it's just stunning. So thank you so much, Patricia. I hope I get to see more of you. Uh, actually, I think next weekend is the Knitter's Frolic in Toronto, but I won't be going this year. I had hoped to go last year and then I didn't end up going because it was just, that was a time when my father had been in the hospital and I was just too exhausted afterwards. So I didn't go. This year I'm not going because next weekend I'm actually going to uh, Greenwich, New York. It's about a five hour drive from here and I'm going to the Knit Local Getaway, which is a retreat, very sort of nice informal retreat that's being hosted by Sarah, who's also known as Sarah Pomegranate. And it happens during the, uh, oh, what did they call it now? It's the Washington County Fiber Tour, essentially. And so all the wool mills um, are part, or not all, but many of the wool mills or or uh, dyers in the area of Washington County in upstate New York are ho opening their doors. And so this retreat, I think it's the fifth year, takes place on that weekend. And I decided to sign up for that. So I'm looking forward to going. Um, as I said, it'll be about a five hour drive. I've got to make sure I print out my maps and not get lost because it's not, it's going to be kind of a windy road to get there. But I'm looking forward to listening to some podcasts or listening to an audiobook. The next one that I'm listening to and, uh, and driving and just meandering my way to the retreat. So I'll be there next weekend and uh, hopefully I'll have some wonderful footage from that for you next time. So. The next section is a short Q and A section from a few questions. I think I have one, two, three, four, five questions that I thought I would answer of things that people have asked me in the last little while. So um, yeah, I thought I would just answer them. Some of them are about me and some of them are more knitting related. So the first one was actually, I think it was after I finished the um, the TPCT, the perfect crop top, the one that I made out of the pink um, Martushka yarns. And someone asked me if, sh if I thought that um, a yoked sweater would look good on a large busted woman. So this was a really interesting question because I actually feel like yoked sweaters, and, and when I think of yoked sweaters, I automatically think of color work sweaters. Um, and I feel like color work sweaters, when there's color work on the yoke, I feel like those are flattering on just about everybody. I know that sometimes people with, um, feel like they may not look good. Perhaps they accentuate the bust or, or de-accentuate the bust. But I find that what they do is that they highlight the shoulders. And so I feel like for the most part, they take away. Now, if it's really uh, a tightly knit sweater so that it's hugging the body, that may be a different story. Um, but I just feel like I've seen yoke sweaters on so many different shapes. And I'm going to say that 95% of the time, I think they look fabulous. I think the only time that I haven't thought they looked fabulous is perhaps in two situations. 
One where perhaps the person's really broad shouldered. So then they, the, the yoke, which is already accentuating uh, this part of the body, and then and if you've got really broad shoulders, it, depending on how the rest of you is built, that's, I think I've seen maybe one or two where I've thought, ooh, perhaps that wasn't the best for that person. But it could also have to do with the ease. You know, there's so many factors in sweater making to take into account that I think that, um, you know, if, if you are, depending on how you're built, if it's, if it's more snugly built or more loosely built, you know, that'll, or knit, that'll have an impact on how it looks on you. I think the neck opening is also another another thing to to bear in mind. And I mentioned that I felt like this neck opening was a little bit more open. I think I would have liked it to be a little bit more closed. But it's not, you know, it's not falling off my shoulders or exposing my bra strap or anything like that, which tends to bother me. It doesn't bother others, but it bothers me. But one thing I think to be careful of, perhaps if you are a, a larger busted person, is if the neck opening is really big and or tends is a little bit bigger than perhaps it was in the picture and then you've got the color work that's kind of drooping as a result of that it can kind of make a very heavy look and one thing i think that one can um, do especially if either way if it's top down or bottom up is have less stitches around the neck if you are starting from the top and you are going to knit one size for your bust but perhaps you're smaller up here and making the the number or casting on the number of stitches that you need for your bust may be too much for your shoulders so it's not a crazy idea to cast on less and do an extra set of increases to to account for that you know a fewer number of stitches and sometimes you know 20 stitches can make a huge difference on a neckline and you can incorporate that somehow in you know adding a second set of increases or something like that so that you end up with a smaller neckline and so the color work is kind of more up here rather than drooping down I think that's the, those are my musings on, on yoked sweaters and how they might fit on different shapes. But if you just pick uh, any Jennifer Stein gas pattern, for example, um, and go, or even any, any of uh, Isabel Kramer's uh, yoked sweaters that are not color work, but they usually have some sort of a patterning here, and look at the different, um, different versions of them, I really feel like they look good on a lot of different shapes. So uh, personally, I think the neckline is probably the biggest consideration, but otherwise I think they just tend to look good on a lot of people. So, I mean, one consideration is how much patterning or color work is there is, like this has very little. The Arwen, which I made, the, 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 the patterning is down here, but I find it really attractive and I find it accentuates the shoulders, which I, I, I like, I find that it's flattering. Um, but I find that they really do look good on a lot of people. So um, I don't know if you have any comments to add to that below or any considerations that you take into account when deciding whether to make a yoked sweater or how you make it, please feel free to come in below and here in YouTube or even into the group where the uh, show notes are because I always have an episode thread going and so you can also come in there if you want. And if you're curious to see what other people have to say, you can read through the comments. So that was one question. Another question, the rest of the questions, uh, well, another question was about how do I manage to knit so much? That's a good question. Because <laughs> I tend to be a bit of a mono knitter. So, and when I get going on something, even if I have other things, I, I will put those things aside and I just finish that one thing and then go back. So I think it looks like I knit a lot. I probably knit about an hour a day, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. For example, Monday nights I take my son to soccer and then I have about an hour and a half of just relaxing and knitting, um, which is one of the reasons I like to take him to soccer. <laughs> if I'm not going to do shopping, sometimes I go into a bit, bit of shopping. Um, as I said, I try to knit at lunchtime. But generally, you know, at around nine o'clock in the evening until I go to bed at around 10, 
Uh, it's a time when I have a nice cup of tea and I watch a podcast or I listen to an audiobook or I'm watching a program on TV and, um, and knitting. Uh, that's that's my, my prime knitting time. And then on the weekends, it might be a little bit more. I'm not an excessively fast knitter. I would say that I'm a medium speed knitter, to be honest, but I do tend to focus. You, you can see that I've got a few whips, but um, I do tend to focus on one thing at a time and then, on, and then go back to the others. The blanket, uh, the crochet blanket, is probably the only thing that gets a little bit of attention on a regular basis. Otherwise, I tend to be a bit of a mono knitter. So I think it can look like I do a lot, but it's that I finish one thing at a time. It usually takes about a month for me to make a sweater. Uh, we used to joke with my friend Sue of the Tangled Skein that it would take me 28 days because there just seemed to be this 28 day thing. Sometimes it does, sometimes it takes more. Um, the nuke is taking me less because it's just, it's a little top, it's a bit cropped, There's, uh, it's loosely knit. But um, yeah, I think that's my answer. Some people are really fast knitters and I see how fast they knit. I'm not one of those and I honestly don't try to knit fast. I don't want to knit fast. I want to just enjoy my knitting. And sometimes I might end up going faster just because the stitches are making me go faster and other times it might be slower um, but I certainly don't try to knit quickly. What I do try to do is choose things that I enjoy. I also tend to choose things that are quite simple. Um, I'm not one to be knitting like intense color work or intense cables. Those are things that can slow you down. I don't knit them because I don't love them. I, I don't tend to like all over color work generally and I don't tend to like all over cable. Um, I, I like things that are simple with details and so they end up being a little simpler and that could be another reason that I get through things a little bit more quickly. So thank you for the questions though. I'm enjoying answering some questions. Another person asked where I am from, um, that my husband speaks Spanish and I speak Spanish and, and so although I think I've mentioned this probably you know here and there along the way, um, I thought I would address it again. Uh, so I, why do I speak Spanish, first of all? Because my background is not at all Spanish. Um, I speak Spanish because I lived in Spain. I started studying Spanish in high school in grade 11, and I really enjoyed it. And I always enjoyed languages and enjoyed learning languages. Um, and I was in immersion here, so this meant that I studied in English and French at school, and we spoke Finnish. Um, and I just loved, I studied German later on. Um, I only studied it for one year and I, that's a language that I'd actually like to go back to. But I started Spanish in high school and after I finished high school, when I went to university, I actually went on a trip with the university to Spain in first year university. We were in Madrid and I decided like in my first hour in Madrid that when I finished university, I was gonna go back. I only intended to go back for a year um, after I finished university and teach English and then I thought I'd go to France for a year and improve my French and then I thought I'd go to Finland for a year and improve my Finnish. I ended up living in Spain for four years and teaching there the whole time so I became quite fluent at speaking Spanish and then when I came back to Canada eventually I met Alejandro and um, so Spanish continued in my life. It was awfully handy to speak Spanish when you've married uh, or met somebody who comes from a Spanish-speaking country and whose family doesn't necessarily speak English. So Spanish is something that uh, is part of my everyday life. I don't actually speak it that often because I'm a little lazy. And I realized this time when I was in Uruguay, I was like, my Spanish actually could use a bit of polishing up. So it was nice to be able to be there and, and speak Spanish. But I certainly always speak Spanish with the family and so forth. That's why I speak Spanish. But in fact, I was born in Finland, um, in Helsinki. My mother is from Finland and um, my father was from Turkey. And he studied um, architecture at university in Turkey and immediately after left. He lived in Switzerland for a while. My goodness, suddenly I'm forgetting where, but he lived in Switzerland uh, for a year and then moved to Copenhagen for another year. And while he was in Copenhagen, he traveled through Scandinavia. My father always loved Scandinavian design and especially Alvar Aalto, who was a Finnish, who was a Finnish architect, one of the most famous Finnish architects. So he met my mother in Finland 
and so I am actually half Finnish and half Turkish and um, and that is my background so I don't speak any Turkish and I haven't spent as much time in Turkey as I have in Finland because when I was younger we spent pretty much every summer in in Finland so uh, so that is where I'm from we came to Canada when I was two um, lived first in Quebec City until I was about five and then we moved here to Ottawa and I grew up in Ottawa as an adult as you know I'm back here but I lived in Spain for a while and then I lived in Montreal for another little while before Alejandro when I met him in Montreal he got a job here in Ottawa and I was able to transfer to Ottawa and um, and so here we are back in Ottawa so that's where I'm from essentially and uh, so thank you for that question as well and then the uh, la another question was about how it works to have English and French here in Ottawa so Ottawa is the capital city of Canada this is also known as the national capital region and one of the reasons it's known for that is that Ottawa and uh, which is in the province of Ontario and the province of Quebec actually the border of those two places is here um, one of the borders you know I mean obviously the border is longer than just here but we have the um, river that sort of separates the two uh, provinces and so there are people who live in Ottawa but work on the Quebec side in Hull or Gatineau as it's called and vice versa people in Gatineau come into Ottawa to work so it's a um, it's a very bilingual area although I have to say that I think that English uh, dominates for sure and um, I would say that the French in this area can be a little bit influenced by the English as well and um, it's two provinces so while there are certain things that you can just go back and forth and it doesn't really matter taxes for example if you live in Quebec but you pay but you work here you know you are paying taxes as you're as if you are living here but then you have to pay them back in Quebec because the tax brackets are different and so forth so there uh, I'd not explain that well but um, depending on how things go you know the taxes are different the healthcare systems different so if you live in Gatineau you, you should be going to a doctor and a hospital in Gatineau but there are some situations where people come to Ottawa for specialists and things like that so it is it is very um, intermixed um, you know people come shopping back and forth there's no border there's no it's free to go back and forth but of course the provincial laws can be different um, for example uh, legal alcohol age here in Ontario is 19 whereas in Quebec it's 18 so if you're 18 in Ontario you can just cross the bridge go over to Quebec side and buy alcohol um, no problem whereas here you have to wait so there's little things like that that are definitely different and and um, and have to be respected for sure but um, it does make for um, I think a really nice uh, mix in the city there are a lot of francophones in in Ottawa um, even though as I said English tends to be the predominant language you still hear French a lot and um, you are expected to be able to receive the services in either language and um, yeah so it's it's really it's really fun so I, I haven't answered that question I think completely fully but there's a little bit of information about that um, and then the last question that I had was about the piano and who plays the piano so when we got that piano I don't know maybe six seven years ago I was taking classes and I actually did my grade three uh, exam and uh, which I passed with flying colors by the way <laughs> um, but uh, I then eventually stopped taking classes but Isla was taking classes and is still taking classes so Isla is the one who plays uh, more often than anything I really never practice which is unfortunate I've just kind of let it go and but there has been something kind of pulling me to it so let's see if I actually pull a book out and start practicing but um, yeah that's a, a Yamaha U1 one a standard sort of stand-up uh, piano that I got secondhand about uh, six years ago or so and um, yeah I really enjoy having it 
and actually I don't know if you can see this maybe I'll put in a little video but there is a tapestry that's the cat scratching board there but above the piano you see that long um, long circular circular motif a tapestry that's actually from Manos del Uruguay and it's a felted piece and um, it's there on a long dowel and there's actually a needle felted angel that I made years ago but um, that is a very typical type of thing that could come from Manos del Uruguay I told you last time that they tend to uh, manufacture things a lot more and which you'll see in the footage at the end of the video um, and they make a lot of clothing and they they have other other kinds of crafts as well not everything is yarn based but we ended up buying two of those one is a wedding present for a friend of Alejandro's and that one for us um, several years ago now so anyway I'll put it back here you don't want to look at the scratch board for the rest of the day <laughs> Anyway, so that concludes that uh, question and answer. Thank you for those questions. It was really fun and hopefully my questions, my answers made some sort of sense. So last time I didn't tell you about the books that I have finished recently. I told you I'd tell you next this time. So here I am. Um, I have to say in this last year, I've really enjoyed audiobooks. When an audiobook is decently or well read, it's, it's a real joy to listen to. And uh, so I, I have never been a gigantic reader, but somehow in the last few years, I really stopped reading. So the discovery of audio, audiobooks has been wonderful. Um, and I find I like listening to audiobooks as I'm walking. Um, I don't necessarily listen to them that much when I'm at home, but I, they're a great way for me to travel back from work listening to books. So I, I've told you before that I was listening to Becoming by Michelle Obama and Michelle Obama actually read the book and it was really nicely read. Um, that book to me was an absolute delight. I loved it. Um, it was like getting to know a really beautiful human being. Um, it was, first of all, really nicely written, uh, very accessible, but at the same time, really well written, very well described, straightforward yet rich. I really, really enjoyed it a lot. I really enjoyed hearing about, um, about her life, um, but less about her life uh, than really, I, what I really, really enjoyed about it was how matter of fact and straight she talked about racial issues, she talked about gender issues, um, she talked about marriage. Um, I just, I really, I felt like I was listening to somebody who is a, you know, a really just really well thought out person and had rich things to say. Um, so I really enjoyed the book so much um, that I found it difficult to finish the book, but I really highly recommend it. If you've been thinking about reading it, um, it's, it's a real pleasure to read and hearing about her relationship with Obama was also an absolute delight. And um, I just felt like it was a very honest book. That's how I felt about it. And I felt like I was sitting down to talk with a friend um, and hearing, hearing about her life and hearing about her thoughts. And as I said, I felt like she spoke about some difficult things very matter-of-factly and very plainly and straightforward and I really 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 appreciated that so that was an absolute delight well hello there this is Selma of the future I seem to have a little bit of some technical difficulties with my last segment of the video um, and have lost it. So I have decided just to cut it off there for now. Um, I'll be back, hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping I'm gonna be back in about three weeks and I'll talk a little bit more about um, the other books uh, beyond the Becoming book that I've read. Um, so you wanna talk about Race by Ijeoma Aluo and um, Don't Let Go by Harlan Coben. And perhaps I'll even have finished the book that I'm currently listening to, which is uh, Forgiveness by Mark Sakamoto. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to stop there just because I realized also that 
um, the podcast is getting a little long, so I'll just stop for now. And hopefully you have um, uh, enjoyed the episode and uh, don't mind this little discombobulation of mine. But I will see you in three weeks. Um, And in the meantime, I will have gone to a knitting retreat. So I'll tell you all about that next time. And possibly a trip to Montreal as well. Um, So you never know, there could be a trip to Espace Tricot. Don't tell anyone. Anyway, that's it. So we are actually an evening, a little, a day later. Um, Today I'm wearing my ranunculus. Oops, which just went purpley blue. But really we know that it's kind of more of a mauvey color like that. Um, I got this new pink blouse and um, it's a little light um, and I thought oh what would the ranunculus look like with it and I quite like it so I was wearing that today anyway I hope this podcast has found you well and um, we will see you in three weeks take care friends happy crafting bye bye Esta noche tengo gana de buscarla Mira de borrar lo que ha pasado y perdonarla Y ya no me importa el que dirán Ni de las cosas que hablarán Toda la gente siempre habla Ay, yo no pienso más que en ella toda hora Y es terrible esta pasión devoradora Y ella casi sin saber Sin siquiera sospechar Y deseo de volver Que me has dado vida mía Que ando triste noche y día Mirar rondando siempre tu esquina Mirando siempre tu casa Y esta pasión que lastima Y este dolor que no pasa Hasta cuando iré sufriendo el tormento